When you're producing a film that's in the neighborhood of $100 million or more, that is a remarkable, remarkable responsibility. And you have to think about a whole different line of stuff than you think about when you're producing a low-budget feature. Today, we're talking with a guest who literally has spent his whole career producing that kind of movie. He's at an incredibly high elite level of production here in Hollywood. And you're going to find out some secrets that you probably didn't know about producing films at an incredibly high level. All right, welcome Ralph Winter, welcome. mega producer in Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we've known each other for a long time. You've produced a wide range of movies. Here, I can read a list that people would recognize. X-Men, Fantastic Four, Star Trek, uh, Wolverine. I mean, the list goes on and on. Adrift, uh, you did The Promise on the Armenian Genocide. You've also done some things with Netflix. Now you're, you're working with uh, FX Network. So you're doing big tentpole movies, you're doing new platform stuff. Um, how did all this start? I mean, if I recall, you were at UC Berkeley, but you weren't a film student, right? No, I was a history major and I also, you know, in math and computer science. So, uh, I, yeah, I got a job just to sort of wait until my wife finished school. <laughs> And then we were going to switch and I was going to go back to school or be a pastor or do something like that. Wasn't so sure. how did you get to Hollywood? I worked for a department store for about three and a half years making industrial videos. You know, how to ring the register, how to take inventory, boring. Yeah, how to I greet did some customers. for Phillips Petroleum. On yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did yeah. the same thing. So it was good training and I didn't know much about yeah. what I was doing. I hired some consultants from Sony because I bought Sony equipment for the company. Okay. But it was it was fun. It was good, you know, five, six minute storytelling, learn about what's effective, learn about in a business environment, you know, what uh, management is looking for yeah. and how do you reach an, a captive audience? Because, you know, department store employees could care less about watching a video. That's true. About inventory. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than Employee that. Employee orientation films were exactly. certainly my favorite. But I actually got in trouble <laughs> making one of those. Oh, really? Yeah, I made one about employee benefits, which normally is a video about big talking heads and charts and yeah. graphs and engulf and devour and how you're not going to make any money. Right. And so I made a, a, I tried to be clever about it and hired um, a, an out of work writer. And we had two people in the years before yeah. You, when you deposit your check, you go into a bank and an older woman in line, yeah. younger guy behind, and he sees her uh, with her, her paycheck. Yep. And she's scratching her head and he kind of looks over her shoulder to see, you know, look, and she catches him and she says, uh, and he goes, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought you worked at the Broadway. <laughs> and um, he, she says no. And he goes, well, I work at the Broadway and I get 15% off of everything I buy. Oh. And he takes the check out of her hand and he goes, that's worth about 15% of your check. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he goes through the yeah. line and they keep tearing up her paycheck and, you know. Okay. And then I went to the stores, I did the analysis, I, I put it in front of store employees and, you know, what's the, what do you know about your benefits before I play the video? You know, they don't care. They don't. Afterwards, the learning is great. Yep. But this, but the management called me on the carpet and said, "You're wasting. You, you spent three thousand dollars of our money making videos about employees tearing up their paychecks." Uh, well, here's the it. research. Here's what I did, and they yeah. go, "Okay, well that's okay. Yeah, don't do it again." <laughs> so I didn't last long. There. Okay. Well, so how did you make that bridge from department store videos to Hollywood? Had an, a job opportunity at uh, Paramount Pictures in post production, so I took my uh, video experience. Yeah and use that in post-production at Paramount, that where they were doing Mork and Mindy, Taxi, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, all on film, three camera film shoots. Right. And, uh, um, and I learned much in the tape room at the time, yeah. right? Yeah, but they didn't want to do it. They, did, they didn't want to switch. And so I got to, you know, and I thought everyone, I didn't know any. Yeah. So I thought everyone knew. Everyone doesn't know. No. So I went with the film from the set to the lab to negative assembly to see what dailies were about, went to the optical house, did all that stuff. And what I found was nobody knew. And I be quickly became an expert. Wow. Finding a niche where oh, yeah. nobody else knows. Nobody knew. No matter how low in the food chain you may have been, yeah. you became the expert. They all talked about it. So because yeah. I was paranoid and didn't know, I went all night to the lab. I went to the optical house. I went to the dubbing stage. I learned all that stuff. 
and suddenly with a little bit of knowledge you become an expert and I've been able to leverage that in my career over the years over the years that's a great word for interns for assistants for people coming to Hollywood or any place else for the first time that no matter how low you are on the food chain a be aggressive about learning I mean, you went to every department you possibly could, yeah. which I think is important. Put in the hours. If you're willing to work later than anybody else, you're going to get the gig. That's right. And um, I think also, I, I love the idea because I was in that world, that video world early on as well. That was my first experience, although I'd done 16 millimeters. because we're old. Yeah, well, it's true. Yeah. It's yeah. true. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, it does, it, there, for, a, for a while, there's a time when you become the master of this niche that nobody else knows, which makes a big difference. Well, the other thing is you said there, I think, is important that you got to put in the time and you got to put in the effort. So when we would ship pilots to New York, those had to be delivered by 7 a.m. Okay. in New York. So uh, rather than face the wrath of whether or not that's happening or not, right. I was the one who followed up. So I get up at 3.30 to check with the time change. Has it been delivered? Was it signed for? So when an executive calls me at 7.15 in the morning says, where the heck is my yeah. pilot? I tell him to look at his front door because it's already was signed for 35 minutes ago. <laughs> so that, er that earned me the opportunity to say, well, if you got to yeah. get it there, you got to call Ralph. Oh, that's good. If you got to get there, get it there, you got to call Ralph. So how, how did you start moving up the ladder then from that point? Well, was there a single big jump or was it a lot of little steps? I think it was building a relationship with the guys on Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. The that director was one of the shows you were working and, on. And the producer. That was made in the TV division. So yeah. I built a relationship with them. I knew about computer graphics. I knew about math and all that stuff. So I was able to help them make that movie work. Um, my boss didn't like it because they called from the set and said, we're not shooting until Ralph comes down here. <laughs> so in a short two or three period t amount of time, wow. I made myself, you know, sort of essential to uh, get the job done. And then I left the studio to work for the Star Trek guys and then sort of leveraged my post-production, leveraged yeah. the visual effects into, okay, well, I'll do all that for you, but I got to produce. Yeah. So just kind of leverage all the way along. I love that word leverage. We don't talk about that enough in the industry where you leverage skills you have or you leverage your, your willingness to work long hours or you leverage whatever. I mean, leverage could come from a lot of places. It's where you can add value. Yeah. You know, and That's I added good. value for visual effects and for computer graphics and post-production and then they didn't have to worry about it. So for them... You hire this guy and he takes care of those things. Those are the big issues yeah. on a Star Trek movie, post-production and, and visuals. That's good. So so let's talk about producing for a minute. For, for people that may not know out there, um, there's a lot of produ there are a lot of kinds of producers out there. I mean, there's executive producers. There, there are people that maybe put the deal together or raise the money and then they never actually show up on the set or don't even know how to make a movie there are producers that are producers because they're sleeping with the star or somebody else i don't know anything about that i'm sure you don't, no. <laughs> you, I don't know what you're you, talking you're, about you married a nurse that's not the way up the ladder in hollywood no, no. um there, there are producers that actually make the movie uh there are producers that write uh, or, or creative producers i mean what what did you find was the niche for you well i, I think what i've become is sort of a combination of being a creative producer and a line producer. Okay. So the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences recognizes one title as uh, the, the, the most effective and important one. That's the title of producer in feature films. And you get the P PGA behind your credit sometimes if, if you're that guy, right? Well, it, 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 it's a little more complicated than that. It's just the Academy, the last award, the biggest award given at the awards right. is Best Picture. Okay. And the Best Picture Award is awarded to the producer, the producer, or might be more than one person. Right. Um, the PGA vets who is a producer and who isn't, so that there's some that PGA designation means that that's been vetted. You don't have to be a member of the PGA. That just means it's been vetted as yes, this person was essential to the process okay. of getting the movie made, and, and most of that is about the creative process and finding the material, developing the material. Part of it's being on set. Yeah. Part of it's the functional stuff. Okay. Um, and part of it's the marketing and distribution. But you want to find the essential people that know what they're doing and the movie doesn't get made without them. That's what that PGA mark stands for. And with your background in post, your combination of film and video experience, um, the natural slot for you is the guy that actually makes the movie. 
Yeah, and sometimes you're brought in to do that. Sometimes yeah. you do it on your own, and you are that producer developing it all the way through. Uh, you know, you could, it, there's a lot of different roles. Making movies is complicated. It takes a lot of different yeah. people and different skill sets to make that happen. So that's why you see a lot of names, and particularly lower budget. There's it can be 25 or 30 names because yeah. they're trading off a credit for some aspect to help get the movie made. But essentially, there's got to be, hopefully, one or two people that know what the heck they're doing. <laughs> that would be good. So, let me, you know, when you get on the set, particularly in a film, once the movie starts shooting, it kind of becomes the director's playground. How does your job change? I mean, you're still the first guy that shows up, the last guy that leaves. I mean, you're still managing the production. How does your relationship work there? Okay, you know, from the time a movie gets an idea begins. We have an idea right. today, and the time that actually a movie is released in the theater, the amount of time on the set is about that big. Yeah, that's true. Okay. It's nothing. Really and tiny. everybody thinks that's where the magic happens, that's where the fun is. It's a manufacturing process at that point. The hard work is from that idea to the first day of shooting, tremendous amount of work in preparation and planning and execution and casting and yeah. building a world. Okay. Then you do this. Okay. Spend a lot of money in that amount of time. And tiny little work to film. And then there's a tremendous amount in terms of polishing, telling that story, reshaping it, marketing, distribution, all of that, which to some people is an enigma, but something you do really true. well. So, true to that too. So, uh, you know, the actual stuff on set, people have a distorted view that somehow that's where the magic is. Well, that's what gets publicized mostly. Well, you because see it's visual. On the set. Yeah, exactly. Watching me on the True. phone all day is not very visual. <laughs> Watching me with an Excel that. spreadsheet or yeah. movie magic is not very visual. So that you're, to answer your question in my long-winded fashion, no, this is good. The I try to work myself out of a job by the first day of photography. Okay. Because everything that needs to get done, there is not enough time. I started at five this morning and right. making calls and around the world and doing emails. Okay. There's not enough time to uh, do all of that. And, and it just gets filled up. But by the time you turn the camera on, you gotta, you gotta move on. So my job, once the camera turns on, is I'm the forward looking radar. I'm looking at tomorrow's work. I'm looking, is the set ready? Are the actors cast? Are they ready? Are the guys for the weapons, are they trained? Blah, blah, blah. So in many ways, if you're having to fix problems during the shooting, you didn't do as good a job as you should have during the prep stage. Well, there's always problems. Yeah. You know, there's the movie you're going to make. We're, <laughs> we're going to make E.T. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then there's the movie you're making. Yes. Not quite E.T. Yeah. And then the movies you're made. Okay, well, we got to fix it because that ain't E.T. Yeah. So, you know, you, you do the best possible job planning. You're making something unique yeah. that's never been made before. There's a process. Yes, we turn the camera on. We prep. We do all those things. But the actual what you're making hasn't been done in that way. So you're building a unique building, a yeah. $100 million building, you know, and you're doing everything you can to plan for it, but it's unique and different. So there's going to be problems. So when you're making a $100 million plus movie, you're spending a ton of money every single day of filming. So you don't have a lot of leeway for ma mistakes, stopping, adding days, changing plans. I mean, it, it, I remember you told me one time that if, when you're making a movie at that budget level, you just keep throwing money to keep the train on the tracks because if it derails, you're really dead. Yeah, if you're spending two hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a day, you got to keep that train moving. There's a 300 people, 500 yeah. people that are moving forward and, and if that camera's not rolling there better be a good reason why not and you have to make sure that happens because ten thousand yeah. dollars to make sure the camera works and that goes forward and saves a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar day is a good investment so knowing what the priority really is is key and knowing what things cost yeah. And knowing what's important and having the perspective is well, very I, important. I remember when I visited you on the set downtown, we were shooting Planet of the Apes, and you literally had a factory of ape costumes and suits and makeup and armor and, and uh, I mean, literally a factory going in this building while you were out filming. So you've got this long process of, I mean, this, this very complex machine that has to keep going at all costs, right? It's like a military operation. So we, yeah. had, a, we had an ape factory. So our extras would come in you know, and yeah. download their stuff, lock it up, you go through makeup, go through the process, get wardrobe, get propped, and come out the other end of the building as an ape. 
So uh, we, you know, but there were hundreds and hundreds of them. Yeah. So you got to you got to train them. You've got to you know how are they going to move? How are they going to act? And and that becomes a military kind of break it down into squads in terms of how that gets done. That organization has to be done. Ahead so of time. one of my favorite stories that you share is on that same film with Tim Burton, A Planet of the Apes. Um, you went to scout a location for a, a lake in Arizona, I think, right? Yeah. And the like, problem was you scouted it, but months later when you went back to film, it wasn't the same lake because of drought. It had dropped a number of feet. We picked Lake Powell. Uh, Tim could shoot anywhere in the world he wanted to. But there's only very, there are very few places in the world that have just water and rock, no greenery. Okay. And Lake Powell is that. And ironically, that's where the first Planet of the Apes shot. Oh, interesting. Same place. Okay. So we went there and scouted and figured out in September, this is the place we want to be. And our first photography was going to be at night. And we didn't quite prepare for all of what that means. Okay. So we come back to shoot in November, but when, as we're there prepping the last few days, the water level has dropped like about four feet. And this is in the news now about how that yeah. water supply is really low. But it dropped about four feet in the lagoon we were going to shoot in with some horses and apes and, and actors. Uh, the lagoon level went down. There was no water in it. So... Uh, we immediately got uh, our special effects boys and a barge and a pump, and we started pumping water into the lagoon. We're pumping water out of Lake Powell into a lagoon of Lake Powell to raise the level so we can film. Okay. But it turns out that the ASPCA with horses, that the water was too cold for the horses. No one cares about the humans. Right. But the horses were, you know, endangered because cold. the water's too cold. The horses, by the way, 30 days before we began shooting, had to have a certain expensive feed because of any deposits that they might make on the land had to be environmentally correct and not with any seeds or any outside stuff for that greenery. They don't want any outside, oh, right? Yeah. So our pampered horses now, we had to raise the temperature of the water. So next to the pump, we put a steam plant on a barge <laughs> in Lake Powell and we pumped raw steam into that lagoon to raise the level of the temperature. So my, the, the thing I love about that story is how many producers out there have those kind of contacts in your computer that you can call in a minute's notice to, to shift the water from a lagoon into the, the, the lake and then heat it up if you need to. I mean, it's just a great example of the fact that on a major budget film, you have to be ready for anything, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty extensive in terms of how you've got to be flexible. The other thing that happened was when we came to uh, shoot on the first night, it pitch black at Lake Powell. There are no lights. I mean zero. And so now on your first day of photography, yeah. where you're, you know, who's, this, who's the best boy grip? You can't see anybody. They're all bundled up, cold, pitch black. So we put masking tape on the back of everybody's jacket, director, producer, first AD, because you couldn't tell. Amazing, amazing. Well, L Little things you, it, you, it, you learn. Along that same line, you did, didn't you do a film in China where there was like four or five different languages among the crew? Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing that, that you encounter situations where you've got to just improvise on the spot. And people don't think of a producer's role as being that improvising person. They think writers come up with stuff, directors will come up with stuff. I mean, but producers really have to be extraordinarily creative in order to pull stuff off. This, this show we're doing now about the Vietnam War, nine episodes, half the dialogue is in Vietnamese. So I have to have translators at the right places so that even in editorial, our editors won't know what's being said. They need a translator next to them so that they can understand what the other character is saying. And so then it's got to be subtitled. And then when yeah. you change the story, you've got to change the subtitle. All of that has to be thought out ahead of time and it slows down the process because you have now two levels of communication you, know, you got to go through and explain in Vietnamese why you need to do it this way all right so so there's a lot of people that listen to this that watch this that uh, want to be a producer they want to be a Ralph Winter they want to produce mega budget films they want to come to Hollywood Get, let me ask you a couple questions first of all do people need to live in Hollywood if they want to do this no I, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise you to live in Hollywood really I haven't worked in Hollywood in 20 years but aren't the decisions made in Hollywood? Well, the buying decisions generally are made in Hollywood. So the content gets decided uh, a lot from the supplier, studios, streaming, et cetera, yeah. here, yeah. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you're going to interface here, but you have to live the, here. And the studios are green lighting the movie from here. 
But how often do you have to meet with those guys, though? Not that often. Really? No. Okay. So you've been, how long has it been since you shot a film here? 20 years. 20 years. All overseas, out of the country. Really? That's where movies are financed. What's the most um, exotic places you've ever filmed? Uh, or I should say most difficult. Well, those are two different questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm in Thailand now. Uh, Fiji was interesting. Yeah. You know, New Zealand is you beautiful. You shot a drift in Fiji, right? right. And that right. was an largely on the water. That's a whole right. different right. pile of problems, well, right? Enormous. A, a complexity that is, is hard to wrap your head around. Really? Yeah. Just being on the water? Well, you know, you, you, here's a typical day on the water. Okay. Um, your safety guy is going to go out to where the boat is going to be where you're going to film. This was a disabled boat and then a work boat that pulls up next to it for us. Okay. So your safety guy's up at four and he goes out on a motorized boat to a GPS coordinates in the dark and okay. waits in his full frogman gear because he's our safety guy for the day. Okay. Even though when the temperature's warm, we want somebody that can be in the water immediately for actors or anybody else that gets in trouble. Right, falls in. And they're in there all day. Yep. That's his, he's the first one there. Then the AD staff, everybody's getting ready. Our boat goes out a little before sunrise because you want to maximize the amount of time you yep. have with the sun. A crew boat goes out. We have a technocrane, a 40-foot technocrane bolted to the back of a work boat that's going to be floating out there. And then we have a flotilla of other, an armada of other <laughs> stuff that goes out with it, right? Yeah. And so now you're going to film all day. Lunch is going to come out on a boat about 11 o'clock because we're not coming in for lunch. Okay. You stay out there. And your boat is disabled, the one that we're filming on, and it's bobbing, and the other one's bobbing, and you've got a 40-foot sword that's bolted to this boat that's out there, and there's a limited amount of real estate um, yeah. in terms of poking people or killing people. And how far out are you? Two miles. Whoa. Um, all day until the sun goes down, because that's the best light. And now you come home in the dark. Last guy back is the, is the safety guy I talked about. And then you watch dailies, and if you want to eat something, or you collapse, and you do it again. <laughs> do it again. And how long was that shoot? On the water, six weeks. Six weeks every day like yeah. that. Exhausting. Yeah, I can imagine. I yeah. can imagine. And, oh, by the way, you got to tell the story. Yep. Oh, by the way, you got to get over getting seasick or bad yeah. sandwiches or the wind, the sunburn, all that stuff. Um, and again, the limited amount of real estate on that boat, slipping and falling and yeah. whatever. So, it, you know, in enormous obstacle, physical obstacles, you still got to tell a story that's compelling and interesting because when you go to the theater with Kathleen, you know, you don't say, yeah. Oh, let's go see that movie that was really hard to make. <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> is it interesting? Yes. Is it compelling? Yes. They don't care. Oh, it's hard? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm really sorry it's hard. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, I, my, one of my favorite quotes of all time is Francis Ford Coppola, after making Apocalypse Now, said, you know, you, you, you're up to your ass in alligators for a year trying to make this film and then people go see it and the first thing they say when they walk out at the end is okay where should we go have dinner exactly <laughs> you know, nobody cares how hard it was yeah, to yeah. make um so let me ask you this um what are you know you, you, give me some tips all right young filmmaker wants to get out there and be a producer one of the things that i admire about you is I, i've always been an advocate that your people skills need to be as good as the skills it takes to do your job because you're dealing with people all day long really that's the tools you work with yeah. whether it's studio heads or whether it's the director whether it's crew members whatever how important is it to be good as a leader of people well you'll no matter how good your product is if you're a jerk yeah. you know it's going to be harder to get that made so uh you need to be able to persuade people you know i try you know you can Look, I hire and fire people, okay? And right. I'm, I'm, I'm unafraid to do that. But you kind of want to treat people like volunteers and get them on board and, and help them, you know, see what the vision is. And, and you're going to get more out of them in that way unless you treat them as just an employee and, you know. Yeah. So you've got to have that kind of team building. Leadership is really the one of the keys that's not talked about in terms of being a producer and oh, leading a team. I think being a leader and everything that that means is important. I think if you're starting out, um, you know, it's all about the story. You should find an option and control material, IP stories 
whatever it is that you want to make, that's the best. And if I could go back, yeah, I wish I had done that. As Spend opposed, more time finding your own stuff. Yeah, as opposed to just being good at the process. Yeah, you can make a good living at the process, sure. and that's fine. But if you want to be a producer, you need to find material. And, and intellectual property that you can actually develop into some kind of storytelling. And then secondly, I think that you know, you, you gotta decide what kind of stories you're gonna tell and how. Okay. I don't believe there's any bad stories. All stories have worth and value, they're important, they're all good, no matter what your story's about, your mom will support you. <laughs> That's true. But there's a limited number of stories that an audience will pay for. The difference is what a producer does. That's good. So, you know, there's just a limited amount of what an audience will pay for. You may think it's a terrific story, and you know what? It is. Yeah. I, but, but Fred's not going to pay for it. They don't care. And half of it could be the execution of the story. I mean, it could. No so how, how do I? So how do I make them care? Yeah. So how do I tell a story in a way that makes an audience go, "Oh man, I I got to see Chernobyl. I got to yeah. see this. I got to see whatever it is." Right. You know, there's got to be a compelling way to do okay. that. That's the ability of even a producer to tell a story. You have to be able to do that. That's pretty good. I, 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 love, I love that idea because most people don't think it's the producer's role to tell a story well. But my thing is, you know, I tell producers all the time that even if you don't want to be a writer, you need to learn to recognize good writing because you're going to spend the next couple of years of your career working on a film that you can't read the script and tell if it's really good or not. Yeah. I mean, you should at least have enough storytelling ability to know that this is investment of my time is going to be worth it over the next year. So for me as a producer, what I think is important to me to understand about writing, I'm not a writer, but I need to understand the structure of how stories are told so that I can recognize okay. what a good story is and I can help tell a good story. And then you hire writers, you hire direct, you hire people around you to do that. Yeah. But I think fundamentally the hidden roadmap the the path to a successful effective story is the structure it's the way stories are told people tell jokes all the time some people tell a great joke yep. and some people can't do it for their life <laughs> that's true it's about how the joke is structured and told yeah that's true we do a really good job in hollywood of how to tell the story we do a pretty good job of that around the world i, I find it's that's really a great statement because i find all every year i meet somebody who's come to hollywood to fix it you know somebody that feels called to come to hollywood i'm going to change the industry because i don't like the movies they make and within a year they leave with their tail between their legs because what they don't don't understand is they may not like the movies that come out of hollywood but hollywood is really good at making them and distributing them hollywood's got the science figured out and there's a lot to be learned from that there is there True. Is. Now, go, go back to the leadership thing for just a minute, because I think a lot of people are in, a little bit insecure, and I think it's important to hire people smarter than you. I mean, because, they, you know, great talent will raise all boats, and I want people to help me look better. I mean, is that your attitude? Sure. I think you always want to be around smarter people and bring people alongside that can add value in a way that you can. Why yeah. not? Um, that, that's just smart business. That's a smart way to live your life. That's true. Um, we both married women smarter than yeah, us. Yeah, way. And uh, that's important. So, uh, yeah, I just I just think that's an axiom of life that yeah you, you have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. All right, last question. Um, if there was one piece of advice to give to someone who wants to be a producer out there, what would you tell them? Well, I think I already did in terms of the material. I think that's, that's what the key? that's the key. That's the that's what separates and and it can catapult you to the top. Um, you know, is finding material. I love the story of Dan Lin in terms of, yeah. you know, working on Lego and seeing his kids and realizing, you know, the way his kids were playing with the Lego pieces, that could be a story and developing that and using his, his kids as a, as a way to figure out how to tell a story that's compelling and entertain his family. And along the way, it works. He's skilled and talented and it becomes a blockbuster out of nowhere. Um, it's about the it's about the story. I think also there's something to be said for if you it's a great way to break in because even if you don't know a lot about producing, if you get your hands on a really hot property or you find something that's not been told and you have the rights to it, you own it, then you can partner with people or you can figure out a sure. way to get in. Everybody's looking for the hot stuff and, and you know, every studio has people out scouring book galleys yeah. and things. They're way ahead of you. What you need to do is find material that no one else is talking about. 
that you see an audience for that no one else recognizes. And it's not about finding something that's hot, but it's maybe introducing a topic or a way that you can speak to an audience that no one else can. Yeah. And bring that value to a studio. I mean, that's part of what we did at Fox early on with some smaller Christian movies, is we came and said, look, we can talk to these people. We can make this for a price. I know how to talk to those uh, yeah. book authors. And, and we can tap into a market that, you know, uh, the Passion of the Christ tapped into that, frankly, you don't know how to speak to. And they were like, okay, take a shot. And so we made four or five films at a low budget yep. level to try to do that and speak to that. Um, wasn't altogether successful, but it opened up a market and opened up. Well, know, it was the an first. Angle. It was really the first step in that direction. You, you, if I, you, you had a deal on the Fox lot at yep. the time. You were there. Uh, you were really instrumental, and Simon Swart was yep. um, running Home Entertainment. So you guys were instrumental in helping launch the Fox Faith yep. label. So tell me about that. Uh, it, you know, it, it didn't work out for them in that situation because, in many ways, it was maybe ahead of its time, but. The truth is, the faith film concept is still a viable thing out here. Sure. I mean, you know, Mel opened it up yeah. in a way that people hadn't gone to a theater because he is a unique, you know, Academy Award filmmaker and, and told a, a great story. So, Passion of the Christ made a lot of money. That's made sure. a lot of money, and, it, and, he, and he told it in a compelling way. That's true. Not everyone agreed. It was too violent for some people. It was only 12 hours of Jesus' life. It was all... all all, all sorts of different things. It's not necessarily a business model to follow that you can just do that again and Duplicate, again. It's a yeah. bit of a one-off, but it certainly opened up that audience, and that was our angle was, hey, there's an audience that's underserved. You can speak to them if you make good movies. Problem is it's hard to do that and compete at a high level with a $2 million movie. You need more resources to do that. But there's been a lot of people since that have done that, yeah. and... Um, and, and are making great headway. I can only imagine making great Good headway. Good example. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that market opened up. There's other markets to open up. It's yeah. about, again, your ability to connect a story with an audience and do it in a simple and compelling way, and you can find a niche. And there's so many platforms to do that. It's, there's a lot of unexplored territory. I was at the Producers Guild conference uh, recently, and they had a really interesting conversation with Toby Emrick, who's the chairman of Warner's, and uh, Peter Roth, who's the head of, who's the president of television. And and um, they, th one of the things they said was, "Stop coming to us and asking what are you looking for." He said, "We're looking for something successful. We're looking for anything." He said, "Don't come to us." He said, "Go find something that you're passionate about, that you love, a message that you want to share, a story you want to tell, and come to us with that." He said, "We're much more likely." And he said, "We're." He said, "When um, years ago, uh, he said P people have come to us for years with projects that we thought might never work, but they ended up being super successful." He said, "So it's not what we're looking for so much; it's what you're passionate about." And he said that translates to people, and they yeah. get excited about it. And the more you can sort of do your homework and demonstrate the connections yeah. and demonstrate why it can be successful that's the right kind of presentation to bring to those guys all right last question you told me one time that it's not about knowing being a successful producer particularly the level you're operating in it's not about being a successful producer by knowing what's popular now it's really because of a, a big budget film takes four five six or more years to get made it's about knowing what's going to be successful five years down the road how do you do that how do you stay up on what you feel like will be something significant down there you know, I, I don't know if there's a, I'm, I'm not sure there's a secret code to figuring that out. It's, uh, the audience is always changing. The audience is, is telling you, there's a brutal report card every Monday morning that changes and tells you yeah. what your three years of work means. Box office results. Yeah. And so I think you've got to stick with classic stories that are timeless. If you're trying to do the thing of the moment, uh, that's better on streaming or television, but in the box office, I think you got to have stories that te stand the test of time. Okay. Because that's what's going to last. Gladiator's a good movie 20 years ago as it is today. Um, it's timeless. It's yeah. another world. And I think when we can tell compelling stories that take us another world, uh, those are always going to be worthwhile and people always want to do that. Um, the style of storytelling needs to shift and change with the audience. But I think those essential stories, you know, you need to find stuff that's going to last. You uh, have seen the industry change an enormous amount in your career. Yeah. 
and uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it's interesting that you're exploring platforms like Netflix and uh, FX and other places like that. Um, is it important to be open to whatever change is happening in the industry? Well, I think you've got to keep your eyes open and see what you can what you can do. I just finished a consulting job for Madison Square Garden about a new immersive platform they're building in Vegas and London. Uh, it's called Sphere, and it's a massive 18,000-seat venue with cameras that they still have to invent. And uh, so I was a cinematic consultant to try to help them figure that out, at least the beginnings of that. Interesting. Um, so... There, there's lots of new forms of all that that we got to be open to and, and figure out. And again, how am I going to tell stories on a screen that's the size of 22 IMAX screens? How do you tell that story? You don't do it in a lot of cuts because it'll rip your head off that's while you're true. watching. So how, how do you do that? Uh, that's worthwhile in terms of you know, stretching us of how we tell effective stories. Another reason to be a master of telling the story because it can adapt to whatever platform or That's format correct. you're talking about. That's correct. Very That's important. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bye, man. Ralph Winter. Bye. So here, go to our, my blog at philcook.com. Share this interview with people. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to help other people that want to be producers or move into Hollywood or understand that world go to the next level in their career. Share it with people. Rate us. Go out there and give us a rating and comment on it. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in.